Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the God's Gifts to Develop My Loving Self presentation, Jesus examines God's gifts to us at the time of creation, the gifts God gave in terms of our potential, and the gift of the ability to choose between two paths of education and development in love, each with different long-term results. Recorded on the 27th of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. How are you doing? All right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know how I'm going to cover this material in the time I've got either, but anyway, we'll see how we go. And um, I just would like to make a note before we begin about the previous discussion, and that is I'm trying to represent to you concepts and information using a two-dimensional board about what are actually um, not even three-dimensional things. And they're, they have more dimensions than three dimensions, and um, it's very, very difficult, of course, to do that. So bear in mind that it's probably more accurate to draw the initial initial soul as God's created it without any sin, you know, it, more like, uh, it's very hard, but anyway, I, I, just to illustrate the point, it just if we draw it like this, you get sort of the concept of that there is a, nat a, a natural uh, separation of the two halves that have occurred as a part of God's design that, that only, can, only God's love can bridge the gap of, those, of, that, natural, of that natural separation. Um, so God still sees you as one soul, as one unit, one whole with two halves, but... Um, this this state in the union state doesn't even really exist. It's more like this. So I don't know how to draw that, but anyway, you know, it's just it's difficult to illustrate these concepts uh, on a board. Bear, and bear in mind, it's also difficult in, to illustrate the scale. Like I said, some things are the size of a golf ball and other things are the size of an earth, you know. And very hard to illustrate the difference between those states on a board. So just bear in mind, a lot of these diagrams need to be used very loosely. All right? And in fact, my, my choice to use this shape was in fact driven by the majority of your initial concept of sort of yin-yang, which actually has no bearing on the soul either. But so, does that make sense? I'm just using that shape as, a, as an indication that as soon as I draw it, you, you know that I'm talking about the soul rather than the bodies. So, yeah, just bear that in mind with all of these different things that I draw on the board, won't you? They're all concepts trying to illustrate very complex concepts. Well, you know, I'm trying to illustrate the most complex design in the universe <laughs> on a board, you know. So good, good luck with that. <coughs> hmm. All right, well, now we come to the second part of today's of presentations, which is all about God's gifts to develop my loving self. And... Uh, like as, like as if the creation of the soul isn't gift enough, you know. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazingly complex creation. And um, there are gifts that God's given us right at the time of the soul's creation. And then there's gifts that God's given us in terms of the potentials. And then there's gifts that God gives us by choice, by our choice. So there's, you could say there's three categories of gifts. The first category of gifts are the 
ones that I'd like to talk about with you straight away, and that is the gifts at the time of creation. Now, you've already been uh, introduced to some of these gifts. You probably haven't thought them, thought of them as such, but you've been introduced to some of these gifts. So what, what are they? What are some of these gifts that you, you've been introduced to already that happened at the time of creation? So it's got to be at the time of creation. Teresa, and then um, Cess on this side, if we... Cecily. I'm now wondering if creation is the same as conception, but... Um, free will. Yes, yeah, so free will is at the time of creation and we weren't conscious of it until conception and even then we didn't have a very good consciousness of it because we're just brand new, new, newly born, you could almost say, at the time of conception. So yeah, so the gift of free will, that's, a, that's an amazing gift actually. And without the gift of free will, we wouldn't actually be free thinking, free, free you know, self-determined beings with self-responsibility, Cecily. That's what I was going to say, but I can think of something else. Yeah. Um, the gift of the potential to receive God's love. Yeah, we're not looking at the potentials here, we're just looking at the actual gifts that God's given us. So if we come across uh, to Glenda, then Cavill. <coughs> love. No. But he loved us at that time. He so did. But he was an act of love, but it wasn't a gift that we received in our soul. Okay. That has to be by choice. Yeah. If you pass it yeah. across to Carol. Oh, the gift of the soulmate. Um, well, from God's perspective, there's no such thing as a soulmate. We are one soul, I suppose you could say. Yeah. yeah. If we pass it straight back behind you to uh, and back one more. Is it our personality? Our personality and nature, yeah. It's a very important thing that God created right at the beginning. Yep. Um, if we go to Pamela and uh, who else was had their hand up? Let's go, Pamela. Um, the gift of God's laws. Yes, yeah, so it's very important to understand those as a gift because all, all of God's laws, in fact, all of God's highest laws, were all, they were all given um, and they were actually all created before the soul was created because the soul needed a framework in which to exist. And so the laws were created before the actual souls were created. So that, that indicates a lot of, like, Preparation went into the development of the soul, doesn't it? A lot of planning, if you like, preparation. Because uh, the laws had to exist before the soul could actually survive. So God created all the laws and then God created the soul. So God's laws are a gift to the soul. They're a gift to soul in a number of ways, though, aren't they? they they're a gift to the soul in that they allow the soul to grow and, and change and to expand and in fact the way God's you know, the highest laws allow you to expand infinitely but on the other hand they also allow your degradation and isn't that also in a way a gift because basically it's allowing you to determine for yourself which direction you want to take right so God's laws allowed for your degradation and then because they also allowed for your degradation they also allow for your redemption so that's pretty clever to allow a whole heap of laws that allow for your infinite expansion, but allow laws that allow for your degradation, and then also have laws that allow for your redemption so that you can redeem yourself from a place of degradation. It's a very clever thing to do. We, see, this, this gift, free will, made these laws necessary for a lot of reasons, some of which is that God doesn't allow anarchy in the universe. In other words, does not allow anybody to anybody who degrades in condition has less of an effect on the universe around them than a person who increases their condition. And there's laws that govern how much of an effect you can have on the universe around you based on how much love exists within your soul. 
So if less love exists in your soul, you can have less effect on the universe around you. And you need more and more people to help you to have a big effect if you have lo less love in your soul. Now on earth, it's easy to get others to help you. In the spirit world, that's a lot harder because every time somebody helps you, they feel extra pain as well. And they're sensitive to the pain now, you see. So, so yeah, there's a lot of very clever laws in there. <laughs> And they're all gifts to us, all gifts. Yeah. If we go to Pamela on this side. He's given us this playground in the earth and the spirit world and beyond. <laughs> yeah, so the universe has been specifically created for you to play in. In fact, there's very little point in creating the universe unless you were going to create human souls in order to play in it if you think about it. So the universe itself is a gift to the soul to engage learning, engage growth, engage understanding, investigate. And, and it's also beautiful in a, such a way that even the people who do not choose to receive God's love still receive a large amount of joy because they got a whole playground to play in still, but, but they're just limited in how far they can play. Right? But they've still got a playground to play in. It's not, and that's what I love about God too, and something that's not very understood on earth as well, is that God's not uh, punitive or punishing. So even those people who choose to not, to not receive God's love are going to have a relatively happy life. And he's given them a playground so that they can have a happy life. Right? That's loving, isn't it? What do most parents do when, when a child chooses to reject them? <laughs> oh, you do everything possible to punish them. And, you know, a lot of times you get, you know, I've seen people murder their children who've rejected them. So. And some parents will do everything in their power to make their child's life a misery when, when the child rejects the parent. God doesn't do that. He's not, he's not trying to make your life a misery and not trying to make anybody's life a misery. So these are all gifts. These are probably the four primary gifts, aren't they? But uh, Kelly, if we go to Kelly. Um, so the spirit world, what about... Do, is that our creation from our potential of growing or is it God's? Or degradation. Yes, yeah. Isn't it? Mm. It's both. It's like, so initially God created one sphere in the spirit world. That was it. Uh -huh. The sixth sphere. That was it. And then the first human couple that degraded to the fifth sphere and the fifth sphere in the spirit world got created. And then, next, and then they, you know, the other subsequent generations degraded, degraded, degraded. Now we have a first sphere, so called. No one's ever degraded below that yet, but if we did, we'd have a minus one sphere, I suppose. <laughs> I can't imagine it ever happening because the pain, the pain that a person experiences in that state already is so great in the first sphere, in the lower parts of the first sphere. That I, you know, it, it's probably not possible for anybody to live in higher amounts of pain, and so without there being some recognition, and so I doubt whether there'll be another sphere created. But we've gone mm. down to the highest extreme amounts of pain, creating this lower sphere, the first sphere. And then uh, it wasn't until the first century that the seventh sphere got created. Oh, wow. Didn't exist before then. And then once the first person became at one with God, it was the eighth sphere, and so forth and so forth. Each new sphere got created once the soul was in the capacity to create it. Yeah. And that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, but in other, in other um, fragments of the universe, I suppose you could call them, there, there are other people similar to myself. So there's, there's you know, probably eight to ten 
worlds like ours where we have people coming and they all have fears surrounding those particular worlds as well. And a person like myself in those places created those particular locations. Mm. Mm, thank you. Yep. Okay, David. <coughs> It's interesting you said that God gave us the universe to play in. Mm. And as adults in our facade, the word play has many different connotations, some of them negative. Mm. Whereas a child, when they play, they learn. Yes. And they, and they learn by playing. Exactly. And that's the way God designed us to learn, by playing. Mm. Eva, thanks. About uh, the gifts, I was thinking about the um, the absorption of your parents' emotions. Yep, uh, uh, you could say that's part of the potentials that God allowed for the soul. So we're going to look at those potentials in a minute. These are the gifts at the time of creation, and then we'll look at the gifts in terms of potentials as well, because there's quite a lot of potentials. <laughs> And we, in the outline, we haven't listed them all even, all the possible potentials of the soul. But the potentials of the soul are another set of gifts, allowing the soul, through its choice, to enable or engage certain potentials is an amazing thing as well. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Alan, thanks. Um. Is it a, a great gift from our soul that we can give to God or is that something we have to get to at one with God before God can receive a great gift back? You can be in the hells and give a gift to God that God wouldn't normally get, couldn't you? So when you and Mary and the, the other 13 decide, well, six I guess, decided to come back here, yep. was there a feeling in you would this would be a great gift to give to God? Or was it really some other motivation? Um. Um, well, there's lots of different motivations. That's one of them, obviously. But there's lots of other motivations, of course. Yep. Yeah. And we'll talk about them at some point in the future. Um, but the, the, oh, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about the pre how precious God sees your gift to God. Because by creating your free will, God basically closed himself off to the potential of receiving your love, except if you give it as a gift. That's a pretty loving thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, so when, how do you think God feels when you give it as a gift? Pretty good, I it's imagine. Quite, yeah, it's a very significant event for God when one of his children feel the feeling of love for God. So his soul is, I guess our soul has been designed from his soul. So that's why he can receive gifts back from us. Is that? Yeah, well, the soul, as the Bible says, it has been created in God's image. So it, and, and it needed to be in order for God to be able to transmit God's feelings and emotions, God's thought, which are God's thoughts, to the soul. So, so it needed to be created in God's image. So we, we're little mini, mini me's. That's what you <laughs> oh God, does that Thank, make sense? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, and and of course the ver the one thing that God can't take from us, there's many things God can't take from us, of course, because God gave us the gift of free will, which means God's not going to take things from us, but but. God would love to receive your love, and when God does, God's, God's soul is like hypersensitive to you giving love. So when you give love to God, God notices it immediately. Diane, thanks. Um, so for Christian people who believe that you and God and the Holy Spirit are all one thing, mm -hmm. And they're giving love to you. Is God feeling that, or are you feeling it? Yeah, I don't feel it. So that they, God does feel that that they are loving Him. Depending on the flavour of the truth involved in that love, of yeah. course. You know. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
So we're right at the time of creation. They are the gifts. Yvonne, thanks. And Pamela on this side. You haven't mentioned there the intrinsic qualities that he gave us? Well, they are part of our nature and personality. Okay. Yep, they are the intrinsic qualities. So you could say there's a lot of instinctual parts to the soul. Uh, the soul has an instinct and those instincts are a part of our nature. Just like a bird has an instinct to fly and a lizard has an in, uh, instinct and a, you know, all the other creatures have instinctual behaviour, our soul also has some instinctual behaviour, yep. which is all part of our nature. Um, <clears throat> does personality and nature include the expression of emotion and truth? Of course. Okay. Yeah, of course. In fact, it can't be expressed without truth being mm. involved or emotion being involved. The soul's way of thinking is emotional. So the soul's thoughts are emotions. You get that one? The soul's thoughts are emotions, desires. So the mind of the soul is really, the brain of the soul is the emotional desire-based centre of the soul. It drives everything. Yeah. But there's things for you to learn about that later, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're right here? Yeah, no, we're not. So, Pamela? You said we created fear, but did he give us an instinct for protection, like not just walk off a cliff? Um, how does that come into it? Yes, of course, a part of our learning process is a part of being logical and, and self-preserving. Mm. So God created us to be self-preserving to a degree, mm. but the soul doesn't need to preserve itself, does it? Mm. Does it? No. no, because the soul can't die, mm. so it doesn't need to preserve itself. So, mm. so what, what is the self-preservational part of our nature? It's, it's respecting the fact that this physical body has limitations. So God created us with the ability to get the point of seeing that, yes, our physical body has limitations with regard to heat, cold, oxygen, and a number of other limitations. And, and a person who's connected to their soul recognises the limitations of their body in its current condition. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's an act of love of self to recognise your physical body's limitations. So it's crazy for me to g walk into a furnace unless I have some other law being engaged mm. because the physical body can't cope with heat beyond a certain temperature. Mm. And it's crazy for me to go and walk in, in, in the Antarctic without being <laughs> rugged up, isn't it? Because uh, the, the physical body can't cope with a certain amount of cold in certain circumstances. And when I say in certain circumstances, you can actually walk in Antarctica in naked and not be harmed once the soul is fully... <laughs> connected to the body right but in our current state we need to honor the fact that we have limitations based on the fact that we have less knowledge we don't know how to use our soul to control our bodies and so naturally we have certain limitations and we've got to honor the limitations we have that's a part of an act of self-love but it's not driven by fear it's driven by the fact that a person loves themselves does that Okay, well, let's move forward, shall we? Yep. Just want to move forward. So the next section we're looking at is those potentials that God gave us the, as gifts. So, so we'll look at the potentials. What are those? So we can, so Shula up the back there. Potential to grow? Yeah, so even just the potential to grow beyond our, and here I'm talking about grow beyond our originally created condition. Right, so, so the soul has the potential to grow. It's like, um, you know, an animal's body has the potential to grow, but not beyond its originally created condition, not beyond the, what its genetics determine. But the soul has, has the ability to grow beyond its current genetic beyond its current genetics, if it receives external forces or influences, which are God's love in particular, it has the ability to 
grow beyond that. So you could say to grow, and in particular we weren't talking about beyond normal, shall we call it, into the divine. Amazing potential. It's, am it's amazing to create a being that on one hand without divine influence it has a certain potential and then on the other when it receives some of this divine influence it has a completely different potential, an unlimited potential, isn't it? What an incredible idea. Like, just an incredible idea. It's like, it's like you creating a car, imagining at some point in the future it's going to morph into a self-levitating aircraft. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? As long as it has certain things supplied to it. <laughs> Amazing, hey? So as a concept. Yeah. It's like a transformer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Bob, if we have Bob. Yeah, the end. Uh. <clears throat> So the opposite to that, to decline, we have potentials to decline. Yeah, to degrade, shall we call it, to degrade. It's a potential as well. God created us with that potential. And this, these potentials are all based upon use of will. So isn't that wonderful? Like, I can choose to do a certain thing and a certain thing is going to happen as a result of my choice. I can choose to be, do a different thing and another thing will happen because of that choice and so forth. It's a wonderful thing to... So it's, it's like creating a, creating a car that eventually turns into a self-levitating aeroplane that eventually has its own mind and decides where to go and where it wants to be and eventually it procreates and it has... <laughs> how far do we go? Imagine designing this little thing and all of a sudden it turns out to be this amazing thing and who knows what, and to be honest, there's no spirit yet in the universe who's ever discovered the full potential. And, and in fact, theoretically, it's highly likely that will never happen, that we'll never discover the full potential because each new potential opens up pathways for more potential. Yeah, Sam, if we... <clears throat> the potential to develop a relationship with God. Mm, which is very interesting. In it. So it's like us creating a car, working out that later on it's going to have a relationship with us of some kind, you know, but it's going to be its own free thinking, free feeling being. That <laughs> it's an amazing concept if you think about it. And, and what's amazing about it too is to have a relationship with the actual creator. <coughs> you know, it's one thing to create a being that has a relationship with other beings. Quite another to create a relationship that has the potential for communication and the sharing of information with the actual person or being that created it. It's quite an incredible creation, isn't it? Do you think that it's logical to then assume that at some point God was actually developing in love towards being a divine being and working and developing a relationship towards another god even yeah it's but it's possible uh, i don't see like i f always feel there's going to be one god but but the reality is that it's very possible that we eventually may have souls as children and then those children develop a relationship with us in the same way that We've developed a relationship with, with God. Amazing. Thanks. Who knows, you know? Like, we don't know, do we? It's very hard to predict when you've got an infinite future what the infinite future is going to look like when you're in the pro process of progressing in a, in a very rudimentary way. Right. Okay, if we come down to Cecily and then back to Joy. <coughs> The potential to create. Yes, well, that's a part of it all, isn't it? To to create, that's a part of either growing or degrading. We can create a whole heap of negative things, or we can create a whole heap of positive things. Are you talking about on Earth this the the potential on this list for what we can do on Earth, or in also in the spirit world? Everywhere. Ah, oh, because I was thinking of 
you know, you said that you can create creatures and whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Amazing, eh? Well, there's an illustration in the uh, Robert James Lee's material again of the children learning how to create a piece of grass, remember? And, and I've spoken to young children in the spirit world who they're in the fourth or fifth sphere at the moment on the divine love path and they create animals and they create living, like living houses that they use as playgrounds that also are alive and they breathe and they're animals but they, they live in them. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff being created in the spirit world. Mm. It just gets down to your imagination and your, you know, your understanding and harmony with love and so forth. So we're over at Joy. And, uh, yeah, so, you, you know, if you think about all those potentials, it's just amazing what potentials there are. Um, one of the things I love about God, it probably comes under having a relationship with God, is that... He's just the most beautiful example of a loving parent. Yeah. Like people say, oh, we didn't get a rule book. Well, actually, if you just learn from God, God yeah. will teach you everything you ever need to know about and how to treat others. And we did get rule books, actually. If you had to write them all down, yeah. like imagine it would be so difficult because yeah. like, well, you know, how many, how many pages is the Bible? It's about 1,000 or 1,500 pages or something long. Mm. Most people have never read the whole thing. And uh, I understand why, though. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but imagine a rule book that says that talks about one law, like the law of compensation. Mm. How long would that book take? Mm. Man, it'd be like, you'd be thousand, uh, 100 volumes for the law of compensation. And it's far, see, see, God created a far better way to learn as well, which was through the soul-based emotional experience. So actually you absorb all this information eventually and this is why learning with your intellect is such a rudimentary and also it's something you have to give up because it, because it limits you severely to actual learning from God's perspective. Uh, Soul-based learning, emotional-based learning is going to be far more rapid and you'll absorb far more, uh, like far larger pieces of information in a short period of time and you also retain that information <laughs> Through, through completely different mechanisms than memory. And so. it seems to be only limited um, by my desire to know more about the subject. It does. Like it's unlimited, like God always over-delivers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Always. Yep. Okay. Um, if we Janine down the front and then Barbara on this side. She's Janine down here. Hand up. I thought it was really beautiful that the potential to receive parts of God's nature. Mm. Yeah. You know, at this stage, many of us have received God's love, but there's also other parts of God's nature that come with that. Like ex an example of that is um, if you read the book uh, The Gate of Heaven, in there you'll see that Aphra learns to go from travelling over time to travelling instantly. And it's explained to him that one of the aspects of God's nature is this, play, this thing of wherever you want yourself to be, you are there immediately. It doesn't matter how far away it is. So in other words, you're unbounded by the limitation of time and space in that place. So that's a part of God's nature. God's unbounded by time and space. And, uh, and, and we, as we grow in God's love, get to the bit of stage where we're no longer bounded by time and space. So that means you can, you can go and you can actually, like you can be in your celestial home and then instantly here without there being any gap in time at all, not even a second or a millisecond or a microsecond or a picosecond or it's all just so instant. Prayer is like that. The instant you have a feeling for God is the instant God feels it. There's no gap in time. So prayer is actually one of the highest and most rapid, well, it, it's hard to say it's even a rapid form of communication because the reality is it's instant. It's not, there's no delay in time. And so God created you with the ability to transmit certain types of energy that have no delay in time and eventually you become a being that has no delay in time. 
So therefore you become a person who no longer is bounded by the constraint of time in the sense of, you know, it doesn't mean you can go backwards in time because that's, that's a completely different uh, theoretical assumption that humans have. But I'm talking about the fact that there's no time between the decision and the outcome. It happens immediately. These are all wonderful gifts, uh, a part of God's nature that God gives to us through the process. Mm. Real powerful things. Mm. Yeah. Where are we up to, uh, Barbara? And an interesting law of attraction, I get the soulmate one. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. So God's potential gift to us, if we use our will in a desirous way, will attract our soulmate. Well, it's not right, really accurate to say we'll attract our soulmate, isn't it? It's to unify with our soulmate. Yes, that's true. You're already attracted your soulmate. You're just not conscious of it. Now, that's a different condition than our created condition because our created condition, we are a complete soul, but we're not aware of our completeness or anything like that. But not only that... If we don't engage God's love, we can never become what we classify as a unified soul. Now, that's a, the soul union state is a completely different state than actually joining with your soulmate. The unified state is when you become at one with your soulmate, like you become one being, or you are conscious now of you being one being. Now, that's different than even unifying, isn't it, in some ways, with your soulmate. It's now that you've become one being. Now it's a very, it's a very interesting concept if you think about it, because it means that that one being will never be lonely. Just even that is a. How many of you feel lonely at times? You know, yeah, and one being never be lonely. Never be lonely. <laughs> Amazing potentials. Now, these potentials, as we've discussed, are dependent upon the use of our will in a loving manner. So that's that's a it's a great idea, though, isn't it? Great concept to be able to use your will in a loving manner and to be able to grow beyond your normal condition. Like it's amazing, amazing concepts. Mm. So, so God wasn't happy with just creating a soul. God wanted to firstly give you a whole heap of gifts with along with the soul. Some of these gifts, you know, you got immediately. And then God created you your soul with all these potentials as long as you engaged your will. So can you see even in that God's encouraging you to use your will? It's like a lot of parents, what do they do with their children? Just squash the will, you know. You do what I want you to do and that's it. No, God's encouraged you to use your will without defining that you have to do what God wants him, you to do. And in fact, it's an act of love to do that. To encourage you to good while at the same time allowing you to choose whatever you want, including bad, if that's what you want. Mm. Up, you'd like to... You made a lovely point before, um, and I think it was the first time I really connected to it, um, and it's a little bit upsetting <laughs> that it took me so long to connect to it. That's all right. <laughs> but you said, um, you know, if you do, with your will, if you do this, this is the outcome. If you do that loving action, that's the outcome. If you do that unloving action, that's the outcome. So it's always like God doesn't vary the outcome for whoever it is. It's mm. always, mm. you know, you're guaranteed to know what the outcome is if you understood God's laws mm. and, and it, God's it, nature. Yeah, it's consistency. Yeah. You know, this is what most of us have, uh, it's been sorely neglected in our childhood consistency. You know, you go to one parent, they do one thing with you, and you go to the other parent, they do another. And then your neighbour's parent, they do a completely different thing. And so all of us end up with different concepts, different beliefs, different concepts of love. It's not like that with God. God uh, is consistent with the operation of each of the things that he does under the same circumstances. The beautiful thing about that is we get to see God's consistency and therefore we can trust. We can, we, we can have faith and have trust without 
and we know we're not taking a risk even. So, so from God's perspective, it's not risky for you to develop your real self. That's good, eh? To know. From human perspective, what did you learn there? Very risky. Very risky to develop your real self. In fact, this has all been created, a lot of it has been created in order to not develop your real self because you realised how risky it was. Uh, but, but there's no risk with God developing your real self. No risk at all. In fact, it's exactly what God would like to encourage you to do. So that's, that's wonderful to know too. So even if every single person on this planet opposes your real self, it really doesn't matter because God has designed God's universe where he wants you to, he encourages you to develop your real self. And even if the person on earth decides to kill you because you developed your real self, by the time you hit the spirit world, you'll be very happy that you developed your real self. So it's just like, so what are the, the disadvantages of developing your real self are only felt in a universe or in a, in a world where the average person refuses to do it. That's the only time there's disadvantages, isn't there? And even those dis but those disadvantages are still temporary in nature. They're not going to last forever. So, yeah, amazing. If we come down to the front to Louise. AJ, um, are you in your real self apart from the issues of worth that you were talking about yesterday? That's a huge issue, is it not? Issue of worth. How but can I be in my real self while I still don't believe that I have worth to God's extent that he believes I have worth? I can't be, can I? So no, but the answer is... you were is saying that you the have the no, ability to trust God and have a relationship, which is huge. Yeah, but I'm still nowhere near my real self. Am I? Well, I can't be. If I, if I was really, really near my real self, would I have the injury of self-worth? It's a huge injury. Oh, I thought there were grades of coming towards your real self. Is it of either course. you are your real self or you're not? Well, no, no. I'm not. But, uh, but I, like I would, I've said to you, I classify myself at the moment probably be 5% of my real self. Oh, wow. That's a bit depressing for me. <laughs> Why is it depressing for you? Well, that means I'm a bit... <laughs> Shouldn't it be depressing for me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah, I understand what, what you're saying, though. Like, a lot of times you enter comparison. And... And honestly, comparison is not helpful to your development of your real self. You know, the, the only person you really need to compare yourself to is the person you were a minute ago. <laughs> Does that make sense? Or an hour ago, or a day ago, or a year ago, or whatever. Because entering comparisons like this with other people, everyone's at different stages of development. You're going to meet people... And, and hopefully when, when uh, all the 14 get into a proper state where they're back at their normal state, which is the union condition, you, you'll see very large contrast between yourself and them. And it shouldn't depress you. It should inspire you. Like those people only took 2,000 years to get to that state. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> 2,000 years is not long, is it? You think about it. Are you laughing at me? I don't know why you're laughing at me. <laughs> why are you laughing at me? Because <laughs> it's hard to get perspective on 2,000 years. Oh, okay. Well, I suppose I don't think about that. Like I sit down in front, I went across to New Zealand and sat down in front of one of the trees that was my age. It was quite an emotional experience actually, meeting a tree on earth, because most trees have been destroyed, right? Meeting a tree on earth that was the same age as myself. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, 2,000 years, nothing. Nothing. Time wise. Time wise, it's nothing. So you, you imagine, like, 
you, you can't expect yourself to be the same as a person who's spent all of their life developing in God's love for 2,000 years. Does that make sense? You can't expect it of yourself. And if you do, it's unloving to expect it of yourself. It's a, it's a, a self-attack. Yeah, you don't need to do that. Um, the reality is that everyone's, everyone has developed at different f speeds. And many of you will develop more rapidly than many of the people I know from 2,000 years ago. Because if you engage your will on earth, many of them didn't, right? They had to engage their will after they passed. And many of, if many of you engage your will to develop on earth and receive God's love on earth, many of my friends didn't in the first century do that, then you imagine you'll get developments here on earth that occur. You know, you might even become at one with God on earth and you might even have you and your soulmate at one with God on earth. That's never happened in history for a person in their first incarnation to become at one with God while on earth with their soulmate at one with God while on earth. It's never happened in the history of this planet. And, and that you could do that. The hundreds of you could do that. So it's no good comparing all the time, you know. The best person to compare yourself with, which is what I do, compare myself with myself a minute ago or an hour ago or a day ago or whatever. Does that make sense? There's no need for you to make any other comparison. And even a comparison of that kind is only for the sake of your own learning to measure your own progress, to make sure that you're on track. It's not to condemn yourself or harm yourself with it. Hmm. Okay, well, let's look at the two gifts as well, these other two gifts about development. What are they? Yeah. The gifts of development are... our human way, the human way. Isn't it lovely that God said, God's basically saying to us here, if you want to develop without me, this is you can do it this way. You don't need me at all. Like, how many parents would do that? You do it my way, or it's the highway, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Like, but no, God said no. I, I, I'm okay with you developing it your way. That's all right. You're allowed to do that. I'll let you do that. I'll make some laws so that you can do that. It's wonderful, isn't it? Law of compensation, one of those laws. Law of attraction, another law. All, all, a lot of them created to help you do it your way. I did it my way. The, uh, of course, the second way is God's way. Completely different way. Um, and you, you don't have to do it. You're crazy if you don't do it, but, but you don't have to. Right. On earth they think you're crazy if you do do it. It's, it's real weird on earth, isn't it? Things are. But even if you look at those two gifts of development, one gift, one gift is about, yeah, if you want to be self-reliant, here we are. Be self-reliant. You can still become happy being self-reliant. You can still become self-sufficient being self-reliant. You can be self-responsible being self-reliant. You can still do those things. You just won't experience the extreme bliss that comes from doing it God's way. If you want to do it your way, well, that's your choice. Yeah, It's just amazing how good that is, isn't it? How good that is. Like you think about you know, again, cast your mind back to the average parent, man, you're not given a choice to do it any other way than their way, generally, are you? Has to be within the confines and their laws and their their ideas and their concepts and their errors and their facade. It has to all be within that to to get their approval. But God's okay, you know. You can do it your own way. You can even change ways. Isn't 
Isn't that fantastic? It's like, you know, none of this concept of like a lot of Christianity, which is, you know, you do it the wrong way, you're in hell forever, getting tormented forever. Right. What kind of parent does that sound like? It's a bit like my parents, maybe. (laughs) Torment me forever for doing it not their way, but. God's not like that. You can, you can do a whole heap of really bad things from God's perspective, end up in the depths of hell, and then decide to change your mind. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> I just think that's amazing. It's just amazing that God does that, allows us to do that, to change our mind any time we want. Like, I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where people around me just, uh, you know, you change your mind and what do you get? Oh, God. You get attacked. Like, like, even me sharing with you new truths this year, right, that you've not heard before, people will criticise. Why didn't he talk about that before? <laughs> right? and, I, and I sort of go, well, what if I couldn't remember it before? So I'm not allowed to not remember now. But God says, no, you're allowed to not remember. You're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to experiment. right? And if you do it with a pure motive, yeah, there's, there's hardly any penalties at all. A few physical ones maybe, you know, just where you've broken a law here and there, but not, not any spiritual ones if you've done it with the right motive to learn and to grow in love. Like everything done with the right motive is always rewarded. Isn't that great? It's like... Like you imagine, you imagine going home to mum and dad when you're going to school and going, they say, how, how are your grades? And you said, I got f- five U's, <laughs> five, five like failures. <laughs> you imagine what mum and dad would do. And God's going, yeah, it's okay. You can have 10 failures, 100 failures. That's okay with me. Isn't that like, doesn't that, help you a bit to relax a bit with this thing <laughs> to relax a bit with the process and treat it as a lifelong a lifelong thing and when i say relax a bit like it causes me to be relaxed about making mistakes it doesn't cause me to relax about doing it cuz i just want to do it i want to get it done <laughs> but but if i make a mistake i don't get all hung up about it and god never punishes me for it I get hammered by people whenever I make a mistake. But that's because of their sin, isn't it? Like God doesn't hammer you because of your mistakes. And particularly if the mistakes were unknown and you were trying to find out about something with the right motivation. So there you go. There's God's gifts to develop my loving self. So can you see that God has actually designed a universe where your development was paramount in God's mind? Can you see that? So God's intention was that you weren't developed the instant you came into existence. So stop punishing yourself for not being developed. Because God's intention was for you to not be developed at the beginning. God's intention was you just be a blank slate and you, then you determine your own development. Isn't that wonderful too? You can determine how fast you develop, in what way you want to develop, and so forth. You're allowed to determine all of that as well. Like, isn't that, isn't that a fantastic idea? So like, you imagine going along to school and instead of getting a curriculum, and you have to choose between five or six subjects or whatever, you go along to school and they say, what do you want to do? <laughs> and you go, uh, you know, I'd like to go into space, probably. They go, okay, what can we teach you? You know, you tell us what you need to learn to go into space. So you develop up a curriculum and 
you have to learn self-sufficiency, don't you? You have to learn how to survive in a vacuumless atmosphere with no oxygen. You have to create a lot of systems for you to do all of those kind of things. They help you do the whole thing. And then they help you build the spaceship and off you go. <laughs> Where, it, where everybody does exactly what their desires are. Imagine a world like that. And, and a lot of people say well, you'd, we'd use too many resources. Well, no, because none of our desires would be out of harmony with love. So we wouldn't do that. We, we would refuse to do that. We'd try to come up with systems that were in harmony with love as a part of that educational process. But you imagine a school like that. Wouldn't it be great to have a school like you're there, you're five years old, you decide you want to go to school and there's no school. So you go along and the first thing they ask you is to design the school and to build it. So by the time you're seven or eight, you're a builder. So you've already got that out of the way. And then they ask you what you're going to learn next. And that after you've designed and built the school, now you've got a place to learn. So. So then they ask you where, what you want to learn next and off you go. You choose what you want to learn next and they educate you in that particular area. Like, that's what God's doing. Can you see it's all driven by will, desire, isn't it? Our will. Yeah. Very clever. Very clever. Now, I'm always saying God's clever, but that's an understatement, isn't it? Very, very much an understatement. So... So can you see God's gifts to develop my loving self are quite substantial? So firstly, God gives us a whole heap of gifts just to be ourselves. And then God gives us a whole heap of gifts which are about like how to develop ourselves. So, so God's not just leaving you in the lurch or anything like you thought God's been doing. God's been offering you all of these things for many, well, offering humankind these things for millennia. The majority of, of course, have no idea that all of these things are being offered because we believe God to be the same as our parents, pretty much. Yep. So if we have a concept or idea of God at all, we usually believe it's the same as what our parents were. So our parents are punishing, so we think God is. Our parents are vindictive for forever. <laughs> it seems. So we think God is. right? Our parents don't give us things when they feel that we should go in a certain direction that we're not going in. In other words, they refuse to offer us gifts when we're going in the wrong direction. So we think God does that. And we come up with religious concepts that are all based around what our parents did. And then we impute those to God. We say that's what God's like. God's nothing like that. God's just given us gift after gift after gift after gift, most of which we've rejected, actually, because we didn't even know. Because we didn't even know that it was offered on offer. So we've not even wanted it, not even wanted to use it. Yeah. So, so what have we got so far today? What we've got is we've got our real self that God's created with a whole heap of like we need to understand it, don't we? We need to sort of grasp what it is, this soul that we have, that we are, in fact. And he's given us a couple of bodies so that we can interact with the spirit and physical worlds. Right? So that's all good. You know, we, we now can learn, even though we're totally unconscious of our other half, we can learn as much as we wish to learn based upon our will. So God's given us all that. And then God's given us a whole series of gifts to help us develop. So you can see where we're heading with this, right? Tomorrow, where we're heading with this has got to be, well, how are we using the gifts, you know? What, what do we have to do, you know, if we're going to develop? These are all the things God has done. And c can you see that God's pretty much done everything a person could do? Yes. Yeah, which is what you'd expect from a loving God, isn't it? to do everything they possibly could do. If a person loves you, they do everything they can do, don't they? To contribute to your happiness if they love you. So if, if God's a loving God, God would be doing everything God could do to contribute to your happiness, and God is. God already has done it. And we need to see it that way as a part of God's goodness. 
Sound good? Hmm. Sounds utopian. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like this AJ character, he's dreamed up a lot of crap, hasn't he? <laughs> this utopian crap. He's a bit of a dreamer, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting when you start realising that the utopian dream is actually real. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, and you know, uh, that one thing I've learned about God is that no matter what utopian dream I can come up with, you know, based on love, what utopian dream I can come up with, God's already been there. <laughs> he's, already, he's already done it. <laughs> and I'm just catching up, you know. Isn't that <laughs> remarkable? Hmm. And you'd expect that too if God was good, wouldn't you? That, that God's underlying object is for us to experience, a, you know, God's utopian dream. And to me, it's not utopian. To me, I would call it God's reality. Not a utopian dream. And it's sad because when we're here and all this facade and everything, anything that's good we see as a construction of someone's fiction, isn't it? Unreachable, unreal, impossible. And yet, and yet if you really believed God was good, can you see these things would be like these things would be automatic to understand, wouldn't they? You you would see that this has to be the case. These things must be the case, in fact, if God is good. So what I like about all of that, and, and this is something that helped me a lot in the first century to experiment with God's goodness, because I'd come up with this, you know, I was a bit my parents used to think I was a bit of a dreamer, right? And I'd come up with these concepts. And, and my parents nowadays think I am too, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> and, and I used to come up with these concepts and I thought, well, if God's good, then that's probably true, you know. That's probably true. And then, then what I would do is engage a whole series of experiments to see whether it was true or not. And invariably I'd find out that it was. And then, then in that new state of love that I'd now entered, this new understanding, and then I'd sort of come up with a whole heap of new concepts about what might be true, and based on love again, and and invariably they all turned out to be true too. After I went through some experiences and so forth, they invariably turned out to be true. And that's caused me to trust that God has come up with ideas and concepts that are beyond, way beyond my wildest imagination. And that is something that you need to trust about God. That no matter what you can dream up, God's probably already dreamed it up and, a, and also dreamed up a far better version of it than you could. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. All right, so that's God's gifts to develop my loving self. What we'll do now is have a break for 10 minutes if we can come back at uh, half past three and we'll do a Q&A on that subject. <laughs>